So firstly, Todd, it's great to see you guys are back with another album, but it must have felt like a long four years since you released World on Fire. Yeah, it's fascinating actually to think that it was four years, because at first we always kept saying two years, because it was like the, the tour didn't end until basically the 1st of January 2016, um, and then we didn't really kind of get back together until, well, physically, I mean, the record took pretty much four years, but I mean, we were kind of back in each other's pockets by um, mid to three quarters through 2017. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I remember somebody at one point said to me, yeah, it's been, you know, it'll be four years between the records, and I thought, oh my God, that's crazy, because um, it didn't feel that long, but, um, but it definitely... Uh, in a funny way, I just the other day was saying how we just sort of fell right back into this pattern together. We really kind of fell back into this chemistry together that I don't think we even really were aware we were we possessed this chemistry together. But uh, it really just sort of happened, and, and the, you know I think that the record really speaks for itself as far as you know. I just think we, we we're playing better than ever ever, and I think we're really kind of just very comfortable in each other's uh, company, both musically and personally. I was going to say, was it a challenge finding your feet again? But obviously you just answered that. But broadening on what you just said then too, you, you've evolved as a band with this new album. There's no doubt about it. I think so. I think that, you know, it's funny because on the last record, we just kind of like, I think there was a lot of muscle flexing in a funny way. Like we went like a full 17 songs and thought like, here, take that, you know, sort of <laughs> threw that at the world. Yeah. And this time I think we, you know, Slash was very sort of, hey, let's do like a 10 song record. Let's make a very succinct, like the records we grew up on, you know, like ACDC and The Who and Led Zeppelin and Van Halen or whatever, those albums were all 10 song records, some of them eight song records, you know? Yeah. And um, I thought that was uh, actually very bold in a time where on compact disc and whatnot, you can go 20 songs very easily, you know? But I think that, you know, sometimes having a package of, of a collection of songs be very succinct or very sort of uh, like it's one big piece as opposed to a, a giant collection of songs was sort of the point. I think we, you know, we, we, we shot for 10, we ended up with 12, and I think that they're, you know, I think that the, the record is one of those records where I feel I couldn't imagine the record without one of those songs uh, not being there. Yeah, and, and talking about like that as a band, the dynamics of the way you guys write your material. I mean, I, I heard that Slash often comes to a sound check, check and he'll hit a few riffs and that, which he jams out with you, you know, Frank and Brent, but then Miles will, um, you know, put a few ideas to that and then you put it all together. Pretty much, yeah. It's very organic that way as far as, you know, I mean, it, it comes from the top down because Slash is, you know, he's the he's on the top of this totem pole and he, uh, you know, he comes up with these iconic riffs. He's been doing it since we were all kids, you know, <laughs> and, you know, we all grew up on those Guns N' Roses records and and uh, those riffs are, are a big part of basically music now, you know, as a whole. And uh, yeah, so he just he just knocks out these these iconic riffs, and we just sort of jam them and turn them into into a framework. And then Miles comes up with uh, melodies and lyrics, and um, you know, we sort of are constantly sort of adjusting arrangements as we go along until we actually press record. But that's pretty much how it works. It's very very organic that way. Kind of like being in a garage with your high school band would be the same idea it's a much bigger and much more professional operation now <laughs> yeah yeah and, and and delving further into that i mean what's it like personally if you've been in a band i mean even miles kennedy's quite established but slash i mean you'd, you'd have to say he's a rock god wouldn't you <laughs> it's funny because you know you know very early on it was it was mildly surreal you know i was i was a huge guns and roses fan yeah. um in a lot of ways you know i i think that you know uh, slash is in my opinion one of the best living guitar players on the planet. Uh, I think that most people would agree with that. Um, certainly in his genre. And in a lot of ways, I think he's my favorite guitar player as far as what I like to hear from a guitar player. Slash is one of those guys that I, I he's like, that's, that's what I want to hear from a guitar player. And, um, you know, so some of that I think was, was a little, a little crazy in the beginning, but um, Slash, you know, has a way of, you know, making you feel pretty comfortable pretty fast. And he's sort of, he sort of becomes your friend, you know what I mean? He sort of becomes your, your bandmate and your friend, and every once in a while, we'll be kind of like, hey, we jammed the other night, and you know, or, or one night he got up and played with Ozzy Osbourne, and we watched Slash play with Zach Wilde and, and Ozzy and Geezer Butler, and we were like, oh my God, you, know, you 
should have seen it, it was Geezer and it was Zach and it was Ozzy. And then you go, oh, and Slash was there too. You know, you kinda, <laughs> because you know the man so well, you kind of forget that, oh, like he's, he's an icon on, in his own, in his own right. So, um, you know, I, you never really lose, you know, I know the man, you know, personally, but, you know, I have nothing but the utmost respect for what he's accomplished and Rock and Roll Hall of Fame and Platinum Records and everything else and, and now the Guns N' Roses. Uh, not in this lifetime is one of the most successful tours of all time. You know, these these, these things are, are, you know, they're all uh, major accomplishments. Yeah, and, and you've been with the Conspirators from the start, have you? That's, is that right? Yeah, have 2010, you? We yeah. Before, before we were even called the Conspirators, yeah. yeah. Almost nine years ago. Yeah, and then, and now, like, obviously with the new album, because, I mean, when it came here to Australia, basically, um, A Pocket yes. Love and World on Fire... I mean, basically, they hit the Australian Aria, t- Aria tra- charts at number two. So the only way you're going to top that is top spot, mate. <laughs> so you've sent your ben- oh, oh, the benchmark pretty high. Yeah, I know, and I think that. But I think that's kind of a good thing, you know. I think you have to kind of, you know, especially in a day and age where you know it's getting harder and harder to, to move records anyway. You know, I think it's, yeah, yeah. you know, you kind of. And the one thing I will say for Slash is it never really seems to to, to daunt him in any way that. You know, the, 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 the industry is changing, and the industry is is sort of strange and hard to predict. It's kind of like, well, you know what? We make music. What are we supposed to do? Like, stop? You know, it's kind of like, <laughs> ah, to hell with it. We just keep cranking it out and keep making music and keep doing what we do and sort of expect the industry to kind of adjust to us, basically. All we can do is make music and go out and play it and, and hope that the... Um, but the audience is still there, and the audience is still there, regardless of, of how people are getting the music. Um, you know, we, we we just did this U.S. run, and it was probably the best, one of the best uh, U.S. runs we've ever done. And uh, I, that makes me think that the, um, say, Europe or Japan or South America or even Australia in, uh, in itself will probably be bigger and, and more well-received than, than ever before, I hope. Oh, 100%. Something else also, too, on the new album I think it's worth mentioning. I mean, you're keeping the continuity with the, the same producer, Michael Basquette, which, I mean, obviously he's worked with Iggy Pop and Incubus and Miles Kennedy's band, Alter Bridge. But do, do you find that important to stay with the same producer? Um, I, I certainly think it's, it's really great for us. I think that I really have the utmost respect for Elvis. I think he's one of the, the best in the business, period. Um, I think that, you know, I think that it was... Great to have the symmetry from World on Fire to this one. Uh, Just getting sorry, I mean, to jump back the there. Has, sorry, mate, Todd. And you call him Elvis. How did he get that nickname? Because <laughs> he looks like Elvis. Oh, there you go. There you go. <laughs> there's no, there's no real anything clever about it. I think somebody started calling him Elvis, and that just sort of stuck. He's a big, tall, dark-haired Elvis-looking guy, and he's, um, you know, he's, he's got a great set of ears. He's actually a really great guitar player and a really great songwriter. Ooh. So when he comes in, he's he's coming at it from a from a musician's perspective, and from a songwriter's perspective, he's sort of you know objectively able to sort of go, what's the strongest part of this song? How do we bring out the best of this song and bring out the best of each other's individual performances too? Which is really you know the whole game, you know. Something I did notice that has changed this time around, like was the recording studio, and and I believe it's at Slash's new facility, Snake Pit Studios. What was that like? Yeah, we started. Uh, we we ended up doing drums at, at a at a place in North Hollywood that we always go to called NRG because it has a nice big room uh, for drums. You know, which is very important to capture a nice big uh, open room drum sound. And then we went right back to um, to the Snake Pit for uh, um, for uh, everything else. Basically, um, it's a great facility. I mean, Slash um, has his own. Uh, recording studio he had one before in the snake pit days yep. instead of selling that place to billy bob thornton but this one's uh this was great it's it's you know he's got his own uh uh studio and then a separate office area so it, it really it's really a great facility where we, we really love it down there and it's very comfortable very cozy and we we, we uh managed to uh you need to spend a lot of time in that room so you have to really enjoy being there and, and i really do he's come a long way from the wild days it sounds like there's a there's an air of professionalism about him now. <laughs> there is. I mean, there, I was just saying the other day how like uh, Slash is no longer um, this sort of you know I don't know the, the the perception of his sort of like a Jack Daniels in his hand and yep. 
and a cigarette in his mouth and you know, yeah. <laughs> he's sort of now he's sort of like this focused ninja you know he's sort of very 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 always has something you know going on and always has something uh, that he's working on and something that he's looking to perfect and mostly he's perfecting himself I will say he's always got a guitar in his hands he's always trying to be the best that he can be and I think that that's really inspiring all the way around like I find it you know he's in the gym he's getting healthy he's he's you know he's he's always writing he's always you know getting ready to kind of to he's always got something he's sort of uh, aiming towards and I think that that's quite inspiring well I'm the same as you mate I grew up idolizing Guns and Roses and what I love about the fact is that he took on this band with you guys you know like you said back in 2010 and it wasn't just a, a drop in the ocean he, he's really dedicated himself to it and he, he loves this as much as the Gunners I reckon bizarrely so actually <laughs> there's a part of me that kind of in the early days kind of thought well you know, I didn't really have any any preconceived ideas of what it would be or what it wouldn't be. I just thought, well, we're doing this thing to support his solo album. Yep. And I didn't know if that was going to be like three months of just kind of like doing some TV shows and supporting it and playing a few shows and then, you know, thanks a lot, guys. See you later. Um, but it went around the world for a year and a half, went around the world a couple times, and then it was sort of like, hey, we're going to make the next record you know, together, and I was like, okay, it wasn't even like, they, he didn't just sit me down and ask me if I wanted to do it, it was just sort of like, we're going to make the next record together, and I was kind of like, <laughs> okay, <laughs> and then and then we did it again, and then we did it again, so now here we are, and I think he, you know, I think he thinks that he has a great deal of, um, you know, a great deal of uh, love and, uh, and affection for this particular gathering of, of, of people, and I, yeah, I we all really feel like family together that way. And talking about the tours, are we looking at probably, you know, another 18-month tour of the 20 countries or on the back of the new album? I think we'll at least do a year. You know, I mean, it's, it's kind of gotten even harder and harder for us to kind of, um, to, to not only do records, but to, to stay on the road in our own ways because of everybody has all these other projects. And, uh, uh, but at the same time, I mean, everybody's very much, you know, hold their, their schedules apart and dedicated their time to really support this record and we'll definitely be going around the world a couple times and uh, and uh, that's part of the fun is sort of, you know, uh, we love being together, we love making music together and then, you know, uh, and then we'll see what happens after that. I know that, you know, everybody kind of goes off and does their own thing and if, if somewhere down the line it presents itself, we'll all kind of uh, um, find ourselves back in the stink pit together, you never know. And I heard whispers that Australia might be treated to a tour in January, like next year. Can we confirm anything on that yet? I don't know if I'm allowed to confirm yeah, anything, yeah. but I definitely, I, I, I will definitely say that we'll, we'll be in Australia regardless of whatever the time frame is. I, I, we're, we're definitely coming. So people should prepare themselves. <laughs> Good stuff. And just some quick questions, personal ones to finish off, Todd. Your first ever car. My first ever car? Yeah. I always say it was a, a Chevy Cavalier, a very crappy Chevy Cavalier. <laughs> um, but there was a car before that that I've, I've actually forgotten what the hell it was. <laughs> a large boat of a thing. I think it was a Pontiac. Um, and I'm just kind of like, like, I think it was just such like a... The funny thing about my life is that I was always in a band and I was always in a van or a bus traveling off into the distance yeah. that I never really... But the idea of owning a car became kind of like pointless because I was never around and I'd come home and, you know, it, it barely even had a home, really. I just sort of lived on the road. Yep. Favorite drink? Well, I, drink, I don't drink anymore. Oh, yeah. <laughs> the, the funniest thing about these, 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 these old rock and rollers now is we're all like sober and boring. <laughs> so now I would have to say probably coffee, as sad as it sounds. <laughs> And, and what about a flat white as the Australians yeah, yeah. have yeah exactly and what about musical influence influences your personal ones oh I think my influences are the same as, as they've always been it's been like Kiss and Guns N' Roses and the Ramones and ACDC and all the all the, the four essential food groups of rock and roll as far as I'm concerned <laughs> the Rolling Stones the Beatles the Who Led Zeppelin you know it's all cheap trick I, I, I could go on and on because I'm such a music nerd that way that I, I, I can you know if you get get me going I'll, I'll never stop <laughs> good stuff now we're good on you Todd thanks for that interview mate thank you thank you so much I look forward to getting down there I can't wait yeah I'll be coming to see you guys live some come to see but I'll fantastic I'll speak to your management down here and I'll get some um, magazines and, and some stuff sent over to you mate please 
to do, and uh, hopefully we get to cross paths. Good on you, Todd. Thanks, brother. Take care. You too, mate. See you, buddy.